Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first episode of Lean Toss of Politics podcast in a long time, actually. We have not uh, done one of these in, in a long time, um, despite, I mean, definitely since the well before the Canadian election, obviously, but we're not talking about Canada today. There's no election in Canada. We just had one a couple months ago. We're not talking about the U.S. either. We're going to talk about the U.S. in the future, obviously, with the midterms coming in 2022. But today, we've had a lot of stuff happening in the UK recently, um, with a lot of by-elections, a lot of memes about the Lib Dems being posted online. People don't understand what that is. We're going to talk a bit about that today. We're going to talk about what happened with, the, with a bunch of by-elections that have recently happened in the UK. Um, we're going to talk about kind of the state of the race and the election and, and what's happening with that and um, and how COVID is impacting all that stuff going forward. So, um, so today, uh, I am joined... First by um, Kyle Hutton, obviously from Lean Tossup. Hi, Kyle. Welcome to joining us today. Hello. Nice to hear all of you again. Or for you to... You know what? Never mind. Good. <laughs> That's all good. And I'll like to introduce our guests now. So Kyle, obviously, is from uh, our thing. We're going to talk about some guests. You may have heard me on their Twitter space uh, earlier uh, last week during the during the by-election. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Zoe Walsh, Aaron, and Johnny, Aaron Goldsmith, and Johnny Ross. Um, first, I'll go to you, Joey. How, uh, to you, Zoe. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. Uh, thank you for coming on today. It's it's gonna be it's gonna be fun. You're uh, welcome. Aaron, how are you today? Absolutely brilliant. How are you? Pretty good. Uh, thank you for coming on, and uh, yeah, let's talk uh, UK. And also, uh, Johnny, uh, thank you for coming on today, and uh, yeah, happy to talk to you. My pleasure. Okay, so first of all, let's start off with the by-election. So let's go back a little bit longer here than just last Thursday. So you go back a couple of months, uh, the Lib Dems won a by-election in Chesham and Amersham. Um, this was a seat um, that voted Remain in the in the referendum a couple of years ago, it remained 55. Um, the Conservatives won it heavily in the 2019 election, and the Lib Dems absolutely smashed the incumbent Conservative government in the by-election there. Um, so that happened a couple of months ago, um, and that was a really big upset there. And again, a lot of people attribute that to the Lib Dems campaigning on... Um, there was a lot of there was a lot of housing developments. Lib Dems kind of campaigned against that, uh, against campaign against H two S. Some people attributed to that. Fast forward a little bit to a couple of weeks ago, which is a couple of weeks back from now. Um, there was an election, a by election in Old Bexley and Sidcup. This was kind of a Labour Conservative fight. Um, this was a seat that's pretty heavily leave, and the Conservatives won it, I believe, by a, it was a very substantial margin, down a little bit from the twenty nineteen margin, but again, basically the same as as before. Um, now we fast forward to last Thursday when the biggest upset happened, probably one of the biggest upsets ever, one of one of the top upsets ever in, in UK politics, North Shropshire. This is a 60% leave seat in the north of London, in the north of the UK, sorry, well, almost the north of the UK. Technically, it's in the West Midlands, but it basically borders the West Midlands and it basically borders West Midlands, the intersection of the West Midlands, uh, Northwest and Wales. So it's very north. Um... And it was a very heavily conservative seat. The Conservatives won 62% of the vote there in the 2019 election. Lib Dems actually came in third in the seat in the 2019 election. And yet the Lib Dems won it with an over, I believe it was, 8,000 vote majority. Just an absolute shocker of a by-election result. Nothing could have projected it except that a lot of people actually did think that it was going to happen. I'll open up with you, Aaron. Um, what are your thoughts about the results? Did you kind of see something like this coming or, coming, or did you think that the, the Conservatives were going to be able to hold this seat? Uh, I saw it as soon as the Old Bexley result came out, because what we saw in Old Bexley, and I think this is a by-election which is very much underplayed, because it was, you know, if you, if you look at the percentages, it was almost a formality for the Conservatives. But the reason why it was such an important seat was because of how much could the Conservatives and other parties but specifically Conservatives galvanised their support, of which they have a dominant uh, support historically. Um, they have a local candidate who was successful in that uh, area. So if they could do well in the seat in, in terms of raw vote, then, you know, we were looking at a possibility of maybe the Conservatives holding in North Shropshire. But with the raw vote being very small, it was only, you know, 11,000 votes, a bit over that. And only a 5,000% majority when we'd already seen the Lib Dems campaign hard and already seen blunders in the seat with the 
candidates having to take a week to learn the seat, you know, all, various different issues, even before um, the, the scandals over Boris Johnson had come out. I think from that moment, I saw the Lib Dems winning it by a decent amount. Yeah, and, and that's the thing, right? You can kind of see um, results like this happening a little bit when you're looking at when you start seeing shifts against the government in some seats, you can definitely project that forward a little bit and be like, oh, okay, well, we're going to see that happening further down, further down the line. But that being said, though, again, this was just like a huge swing on that. Uh, Johnny, I'll get you in here. Even then, even if you're starting to see swings against the conservatives, like in Chesham and Amersham, which again is a Remain seat, we know conservatives are struggling with Remain voters, um, and even in Old Bexley and Sickup, where you see a small sh shift, but they're still able to hold on to a very predominantly Leave seat. How surprised were you when the Lib Dems won a I mean, this is a this is a really hard seat to win. This is their, one of their one of their top seats, I believe. Aaron told me earlier that's the seventy fifth best seat for them. If, if if this is the line, if they're going to lose seats that they're that they're the top seventy, like that, if they're going to lose seats that in relative strength up to seventy five, then they'll be left with seventy five seats, right? Like, how so? Do you think this is a, a surprising result, or are you maybe kind of tempering that surprise a little bit there? I wasn't surprised at all that this seat went. Um, I think one thing you have to also notice as well, when it comes to by elections, if you want to compare it to Old Bexley and Sidcup here. Old Bexley and Sidcup was a leave seat and it hadn't historically been a good seat for the Liberal Democrats. But in a seat like North Shropshire, it's uh, a prime sort of rural seat, um, typical Conservative seat, which is, what's the word? It's it, basically, in essential, it's a perfect seat for the Liberal Democrats to strike. The Lib Dems compared with the Conservatives you know, they managed to get all their um, loyal supporters out from across the country and managed to flood the constituency like they do in most by-elections that they target, unlike Bexley. But in theory, really, you can say it's the 75th most safest seat or whatever, whatever but come, come a general election, I can't see the Lib Dems holding the seat anyway, because... They'll have other seats they want to focus on in the south of England, and come a general. This will basically be a repeat scenario of what was, if the Brecon and Radnorshire by-election of a couple of years ago, where the government of the day was unpopular, the Liberal Democrats were ex they took the seat in the by-election, and then came general election time. They lost it comfortably. That is what I see happening with North Shropshire. It's an unpopular government in, with Boris Johnson right now, but come the, the general election, the Conservatives will have mobilised and possibly removed Boris as leader. And by then, North Shropshire will be back in Conservative hands. Yeah, for American listeners, it's basically akin to Doug Jones winning Alabama and then immediately losing it in 2020, you know. Obviously, there's the hype of the win in 2017, but uh, it, it, it wasn't meant to be, unfortunately. And I doubt the Lib Dems are going to hold on to it. You never know. But yeah, same situation, essentially. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, right, when you're looking at, like, Brecken and Ranisher is a really great example of this, right? This actually used to be a former Lib Dem seat, actually, a while ago, um, bef way before 2019. Back in the past, in the early 2000s, it used to be a Lib Dem seat. Um, Lib Dems actually held it, well, we would call it in Canada provincially, but in the, you, got, you guys call it the in, in the Welsh um, Assembly, in the Wales Assembly. So a little different there, but basically the same thing. They hold it locally, functionally. Um, but yeah, it's a... Um, it's a seat that, again, similar things, unpopular government, actually an unpopular conservative government, exactly the same thing. And yeah, that is... Um, I personally, of the two, the, the two seats that they've won in by-elections so far this year in um, um, basically Chesham and Amersham and North Shropshire, I think Chesham and Amersham is far more likely to stay Lib Dem. That might actually be a nice little seat for them long term. I would be very, very, very surprised if the Lib Dems held North Shropshire. If the Lib Dems hold North Shropshire in the next general election, something has gone horribly wrong. 
and uh, we are no longer looking at there is no there is no longer a conservative government. If the Lib Dem, if the conservatives or they're not even really competitive, they're not even close to being in government. They're they're at like. Can I come in on that point, Robert? Yeah, go ahead. Right? Yeah, I think if the Lib, I'm gonna I, I mentioned this to you earlier. Um, I'm gonna give you one scenario of how the how the Lib Dems could hold North Shropshire. We need to probably go back to the '90s as to how unpopular. John Major's government, the, the the Conservative government in the 90s, was it was so unpopular to the point obviously Labour in 1997 won a landslide. One example of just how unpopular that government was was in 1993, in the height of Black Wednesday, and just as the Conservative government started getting unpopular, the Liberal Democrats won uh, Newbury, which is a seat just outside of London. And it has fairly similar demographics to that of North Shropshire. They weren't expected to hold that in the 97 election, but they did hold that up until 2005. So I think I I agree with you on that point. If the Lib Dems do win North Shropshire in a general election, then it just proves to you how unpopular the Conservative government is come the next election. But then it depends whether Boris will remain in post or not. For sure, yeah, and and th- this now the other part of this, and this is where I want to get uh, Zoe into this. Um, obviously, we've seen the Lib Dems basically being the main party against the Conservatives in in two by elections, right? Obviously, um, we've seen obviously Cheshire and Amersham and North Shropshire, and obviously, but then we look at Old Bexley and Sickup, where again it is very the odds were stacked against Labour, but that was Labour was the main party against there, uh, and Labour did not f- take. Did not take it though. Um, so, Zoe, do you, are you concerned? Is that concerning to you that the Labour couldn't win in the by elections, but the Lib Dems could? Do you think that is any problem for Labour, or do you think that this is this is mostly okay and that Labour is probably still doing well anyways? I think the fact Labour didn't win in Old Bexley was a surprise to no one. It was always like it was always going to go to Tory, and then the one the North Shropshire one, even though we were second in the. Like in 2019, we came second. I think it was always quite unrealistic we were going to win after Chesham. Then the Lib Dems, their ability to fight by elections is exceptional. But in a general election, it doesn't work out so much. Joe Swinson, for example, like they can go really well in a by election, but then they lose the leader. So that's not always fair. But with like my concern for Labour, yeah, I'm always, I'm currently very concerned about the Labour Party because I think Keir Starmer is not delivering at all. He's not. No one knows who he is, and the people who do know who he is don't really like him. So it's not really working out for him. I'm not sure what we can do about it, but it's not going well for him at all. And I think the, the polls, it's quite annoying. You look at left-wing people, and they're seeing us ahead in the polls. And I'm always happy to see Labour ahead in the polls. But when you look at it, it, it has... You know it's not because of Labour, it's because the Tories are so hated. Mm. With all the current drip, drip, drip of like the Christmas parties and all the lockdown breaking. But you know that the fact that Labour are heading the polls isn't really about Labour. It's about not liking the Tories. And I'm pretty sure I might be wrong on this, but the fact like don't know is currently winning like every election because like people don't like the Tories, but they don't know anything about Labour either. So like, who do you vote for? And that's definitely a concern about for Labour at the moment. Here's if I can offer... um hypothetical because it's not going to happen because uh following uh sir david ms's assassination um labor lib dems are not fielding a candidate against uh whatever conservative ends up running there but given labor's rise in that particular seat if there was an actual contest by election in that seat do we think labor would do well in this kind of climate in south end west or do we think it would just be the same as old bexley the entire county of Essex is currently held by Tories. Mm-hmm. So do I think South End would go Labour? Absolutely not. I think Will Quince in Colchester might be a better shout than uh, David okay. Amos. But... I disagree, actually. Go on. Come on. I, th- I, th- I think if Labour if Labour had put a decent, some decent resources into the seat, um, Labour have made some decent uh, decent gains in South End Council elections from 2016 onwards. 
And considering how unpopular the government is right now, I think they would take South End West. Do you think, do you think all those people would go like Lib Dem or like elsewhere? Just no, because I can't see all those people voting Labour. Because I South End is, dis- is a Labour council now. They've got um, they've got the councillor base to do it. They've also had a surge in support from 2017. They could fight it on local issues and also an unpopular government on top of that. So it I disagree with you entirely. I mean, we've, but here's the difference, I think, is that you, what, what you have is, is old, old Bexley and, and North Shropshire are, are really two good case studies in certain aspects because you had a by-election for a beloved MP that died and a by-election for an MP that was not really liked and in the end went down on his sword. And I think that because of the, the work that people like Sir David Amos had done in the area, I think that they would still vote Conservative. I think that Labour would make gains, but I think even in the same vein as old Bexley, where in, where in a sense that they may get close, but really that's, I think it will go back Conservative. I, I couldn't see South End in this specific time with going Labour. Maybe in the next general, you never know, but I think that at the moment, it would just solely be uh, a David Amos vote. I think you can have a Labour council but not have a Tory MP. Like, Basildon Council partially is under uh, Rayleigh and Whitford, and the MP there is Mark Francois, who has a majority of 31,000, one of the safest Tory seats. So, like, the fact that that council goes Labour Tory, Labour Tory isn't necessarily represented in the, who the MP is. But then mind you, you have to think about it as well that South End Council also has is run by a coalition of uh, Labour who lead the council along with the Lib Dems and independents who are Tory haters. So you have to bear in mind that as much as Labour do control the council and the the largest party on the council, uh, sorry, not the, not the largest party on the council, but they 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 probably would in a by election would have the you know they, it. Considering what the Lib Dems did in, or actually, if we go to, um, if we compare Cheshire and Amersham and Old Bexley here, we're not quite, actually not quite, yeah, Old Bexley, the Labour did nothing in Cheshire and Amersham, the Lib Dems did nothing in Old Bexley. You'd probably see a similar situation in South End where the Lib Dems did nothing and allow Labour a free run almost. I mean, I mean, the reality is that, uh, as us three have discussed on many occasions, local elections do not mean general elections. If we were to solely go on local election basis, then Sunderland Central currently would be Conservative. So I don't think any of us are going to be bold enough to make that call right now. Now, of course, you know, we may, we may see a pact between Labour and the Liberal Democrats, though after the relations uh, after North Shropshire, I don't particularly see that happening on the basis of both of them aren't particularly too fond of each other. And you have to think about the context. In Cheshire at Amersham, you had Labour pouring in support for Batley and Spence, they didn't lose that seat. And that kind of left Cheshire and Amersham open. And same with the Old Bexley, where the Liberal Democrats were fighting North Shropshire tooth and nail, and the Labour had their resources split. So I, I don't really think that's a fair estimation to make. And I think that, you know, South, South End West, is, isn't is particularly a seat that we're currently in any position to project going Labour. And I think the most important reason why, yes, the government is hated, it's hated everywhere, but the, the main difference is, is first of all, is I don't think that many people are currently seeing Sir Keir Starmer as a real alternative. And, I mean, we saw in Old Bexley where there was a blubbed MP, where there was scandal, where the, the Prime Minister and the government were getting increasingly unpopular, it wasn't so much that people voted Conservative, it was that no one really turned out for anyone. And I think that is what would happen this time. Yeah, I think I think those are all really kind of important points to have here. I think, um, so South End West, it, the, is it going to be happening or has it already been called, like it will be, like he's already resigned? What What is the status on it? Well, but the by-election doesn't matter. Like the Labour and Lib Dems are not putting anybody up. It'll be conservative. It's like Batley and Spen. Oh, that's right. That's the, that's the one who yeah. died. Yeah. Okay. So that's just a hypothetical. If like you know, small parties, like yeah, they'll just, they'll just have the, the loads of far right parties, basically. Yeah, it'll be just fascists and UKIP. Well, yeah, same thing. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, 
the thing Sorry, is, I don't want to get political on the podcast. That's nah, yeah. You never want to get politics involved in the politics, but no, I mean it's it's an interesting take on it as to what what happened. I mean, obviously, people aren't going to really point to old Bexley and Sid Cup and and say this means something, but. Honestly, I I kind of have the like I I mean obviously it's by elections and you can't draw much, but I would say that it does mean something. That like if the Lib Dems are winning seats they came in third in and lost by like fifty some odd points, and the Labour can't make a seat in London, it is in London, it's far out London, pretty outer outer London, but if they can't make a seat that they lost by like forty points or something like that, if they can't make that even decently competitive. That says something about the states of the parties. Now, it doesn't mean that Labour's doomed in the next election. It doesn't mean that at all. But it means that there is something in a by-election. Like, for example, obviously, in, when you're looking at North Shropshire, or even Chesham and Amersham, obviously lots of Conservatives came out in those seats. And obviously, in, in, those, in the general election, lots of Conservatives came out. In the by-election, you obviously had some Conservatives come out and vote for the Lib Dems in, in both of those seats. But at the same time, you had a lot of Conservatives just stay home. They're like, yeah, the Lib Dems win. That's fine not a big deal to me. But in in Old Bexley, you didn't have a lot of conservatives flip to the, to the Labour. You had a couple, but not a lot, definitely not nearly as many as you have in Chesham and Amersham or in, in North Shropshire. But at the same time, where basically the threat of Labour, because the threat of Lib Dems winning was enough to basically say to, to the conservatives in those seats, eh, whatever, I'll go watch some TV tonight, don't need to go out and vote for them. But in, in Old Bexley and Sickup, it was enough to get them to come out and vote. I think that says something. Now, maybe I'm crazy. I don't know. But I, personally, I kind of feel like that actually means something when you're looking at that. Now, again, it doesn't mean Labour will never win an election again, but it, it just means something with how people perceive the parties. Well, anybody have anything to say about that? Well, yeah, I, I would like to co- sorry, go I, I would let Carl go. I would let Carl go. I was just going to say, like, what we need is a by-election to seat like, uh, like Southport or something where Labour has been doing progressively better. They're within shot of potentially winning that in the next election. Um, and that would be a proper gauge of what we can support. Not all these safe conservative seats that are, you know, good for Lib Dems to, to try in. We need a proper competitive by-election. Mm-hmm. thing is, South End... Well, sorry, can I just chip in before Aaron does? Quickly. Yeah. My bad. Yeah, um, South End, if, if, if the circumstances would have not been surrounding the by-election, South End would genuinely genuinely be one of those seats? No. You don't think so? Well, no, I, I think so. It's possible. Well, I mean, I mean, look, the, 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 the seat that you're really craving, Carl, I think it's called Wakefield, which may actually mm. get a by-election. Um, yes. But, I, I mean, look, the, the, there is obviously factors surrounding why people didn't really switch to uh, Labour in Old Bexley, you know, James Brockenshire was a very popular MP. He died. So it's not exactly the same circumstances as, you know, lots of um, by-elections are held where they're in disgrace. But, I mean, by-elections are indicative and they're not. I mean, if you were to look at, you know, the last 10 years, I think every by-election that's switched has switched to the next general election, except for one being Copeland. And this includes, you know, Corby, Richmond Park, Brecon and Redfordshire. So they're indicative in a certain sense. But there, there is, a, I think, a genuine an issue uh, with with Labour at the moment is that w- w- when we look at polls, they're very we, we have to look at why are people changing? People aren't changing because they're overwhelmingly joyous about Labour, which is an important differentiation between what happened in the 1990s, where people were excited about Blair. They were excited about new Labour at the moment. Everyone's a bit mayor with Starmer and mayor with his version of Labour, which no one has really been able to define yet, which is a really key and important f- factor, is that really nuttily, this is going into the next election, whenever it may be. This is an election where really nuttily, if you were to have a general election now, this is one where Labour should be getting a majority on the basis of the extent of scandal. Now, it's very difficult, I'll admit, from the way back they are, and I mean, the Conservatives struggled in 2010 with the same kind of area, uh, seat-wise. But even still, you know, the, Labour aren't pushing the way that they're supposed to be. You know, we, we've been talking a bit before this, Robert, where, you know, we were looking through the models and kind of where some of the models you think are going a bit wrong in the North and the South. 
And I think that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of agreement between um, ourselves about that. And I think that's really important because, yes, the Conservatives have betrayed, in many people's eyes, the public. But we also have to remember that it's not too long ago that many people felt the same with Labour, which is why we have the Liberal Democrats making all these gains. Because Liberal Democrats traditionally, from the 70s onwards, has been the alternative. If you don't want to vote Conservative and you don't want to vote Labour, you vote Lib Dem. That is why they did so well in Cheshire and Amersham. That is why they did so well in North Shropshire, because people don't want to go to the two traditional parties, and that's the next best thing. Yeah, I think so. Before we, you've given us a very good segue into into our next part here. Um, but if anybody else kind of wanted to say kind of one more thing about Labour not being competitive in the by elections before we get into the, the general kind of state of the race for the next election, I'll, I'll open no, up the just, floor. Is it okay if I can just go on about? Lib Dems in the by-elections yeah, quickly. Go for it, yeah. I think the thing is, what you'll find is that the Lib Dems, they, they did this very well in Chesham and Amersham, not so much in North Shropshire because that was mainly on a, on a national picture. But the Lib Dems managed to exploit the issue of planning and especially HS2 in their favour because it was the, literally the day after the election they backtracked on their, on their promise on HS2. They when a government is popular, they see a strategy to exploit a local issue, say that there's some sort of alternative voice in the issue in which the Conservatives and Labour are not, get support, win an election, and then when it, when they actually have power to do something, it doesn't, I know I, I'm, I'm biased here, but it doesn't seem that actually, when they have the power, they don't seem to actually do anything about it, and in the, in the case of Cheshire, they backtracked on that. Now that they have an MP in North Shropshire. Have you heard from her on what she's on what she said on national issues? I mean, to we be really fair, haven't. Parliament's currently in recess. So I don't think she has much of an opportunity at the moment. She, it's in recess, but you'd still want to hear stuff from her social media. I know it's not going to be big at all at the moment, but you'd still want to hear stuff from her on social media, considering the publicity that she has had in the by-election and also her supposed shock victory. But you've had nothing of the like. I mean, no one really cares about the social media. They care about the representation. In her defence, I'm currently on her Twitter account and she's talking about the £1 billion that the Chancellor's given to businesses and how it's not enough. She's talking about the Prime Minister has willfully misrepresented the threat posed by Omicron, talking about the briefing that all MPs got by Chris Whitty and Patrick Valance. Like, you can't claim she's not talking about national issues when she is. Because can she take over from Ed Davy? Pardon? So can she take over for Ed, from Ed Davy? Well, yeah, quite, that... I'm pretty sure he's self isolating, or at least he has yeah. been. But yeah, she's talking about trade deals and like the. You had to go on a social media to hear that. That's the thing. No, but Parliament's but she, in recess. Parliament's in recess. Expect? What else is she going to do? You'd still expect, despite the fact she's on from a, from a major by election bounce, that you'd still. Here's some sort of coverage from her. What, what you, you don't okay, follow okay, Helen okay. Morgan on Twitter. Let, let me say this, okay? Let me say this. What have you heard from Jill Mortimer since her landmark victory in Hartlepool? She's had months in Parliament, and I've not heard a single word from her. So if, I do not think you're giving Helen Morgan a fair opportunity. She needs to be given time in Parliament. Well, there, there was there was stuff there given. was stuff from Jill Mortimer after the election about um, Seaside being um, a northeast being a freeport and how. Was it in Parliament? Well, no, because you didn't have the chance to. But this, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, I think they were in recess at the time anyways because of the elections. Well, isn't that the point we just made? I know that's the point you just made, but the point I'm trying to say here is... You're, you're, I think this is... A, you're, you're agreeing what, with us. You're, you're agreeing... Right, yeah, right now, you're giving a double the, standard. No, the, the, point, the point I'm saying is, Jill Mortimer still had some sort of coverage after the election, despite the fact she hadn't, you know, she said she hadn't said anything in Parliament. Maybe Helen you're Morgan, on the other hand, has covering it though. I think that's because we had a three-day local election broadcast. Yeah. <laughs> Possibly. You can't give people but time. But I'm you talking give about the time. days after the election, not about the, not about, and you know, other elections being on top of that. Well, I. I... I, I will just we we do have to move on here, but I will say that kind of like 
there is different pieces to this. I think that while yes, when when she got up there after the heart of the pool and said like, yeah, look, that we're winning this because labor has neglected the north and all that stuff. It, it that is a little bit of important messaging there, and that the fact that it hasn't real like the media hasn't really gone into a shropshire and been like, hey, what happened here? I think it's because we all kind of know what happened. This is not really a we know why they won this seat, right? I think, I think kind of <coughs> media's ambivalence and or. Lib Dem's ambivalence to talking about is probably kind of more tied to the fact that we kind of know what happened and, and we know that this isn't necessarily to deal with North Shropshire flipping Lib Dem. It's more to deal with just kind of a general anger towards the incumbent government. But anyway, now kind of the segue talking about what we're looking at in terms of kind of where the parties stand going into the next election here. Um, so obviously there's been a lot of interest as to with Labour is now taking the lead in the polls um, for the first time. I think I think they took a lead in late, well, not late, mid twenty nineteen, in and around the Brexit debate. So this is technically their first kind of lead in the polling since then. They've been quite a substantial lead in the polling, actually. Um, they're up at about six or so point lead in the polls now, um, give or take. We actually have the newest UK um, model results from Lee Tossett model. Now again, this isn't out yet. All when when you listen to this, it will be out yet. But as we're talking about it. It is not yet out on the on the website, um, so we're looking at 295 seats for the Conservatives, 250 for uh, Labour, 21 for the Lib Dems, 52 for the SNP, one seat for the Greens, and then five for Plaid Cymru, and then obviously all the Northern Ireland parties there as well. Um, it does not strike us. It, it is not missed us that it leaned toss up. Uh, we are very different from other UK models, um, and that's fine. We're not changing. Um, uh, I mean, the thing it is, we are basically what the model is saying, and it's saying it very emphatically, is that there is a large popular vote uh, seat gap in the UK, and I'm fairly sure it existed in 2019 as well. If you probably try to uniformly change numbers, I'm fairly sure it existed then too. But our model is saying that it is very substantial and that even if Labour wins the popular vote by six um, six points, that they're not getting more seats in the Conservatives. Now, again, there's different pieces to this. Again, even if the Conservatives are 295, they're about 30-ish, some odd short of a majority. Um, again, far more likely at that point you would have, because again, even Conservatives plus Lib Dems is not enough. You'd have to have like a weird Conservative Lib Dem DUP coalition, which I'm not even sure that's enough yet. Like it's that's that would impossible. Never even no, that's yeah. Again, it's impossible, right? So you'd much, much more likely have um, some sort of SNP, Labor, Lib Dem coalition. We're actually looking at that. That's a little bit short, but very close, close enough that maybe you can drag in the Greens. Obviously, maybe you can drag in Plaid, and you could do some. You could probably do some horse trading and get some stuff through. Um, but yeah, no, this is not, even the polling we're looking at now, this is not, still not Labour's largest party. There is a large electoral vote gap that has developed in the last dozen or so years in in the UK ever since, after since Gordon Brown, uh, sorry, ever since Tony Blair won it and passed off to Gordon Brown, I was trying to say. But basically, ever since Tony Blair, a large popular vote gap and large inefficiency has opened up. Um, and it's caused by, Conservatives are still going to hold on to some of those seats in the North, and although Labour is making gains in the South, it's still not enough to offset it. Um, I'll go to you first, Aaron, on this. Do you kind of agree with the thesis of the model at this point that even if Labour wins the popular vote by a substantial amount, that they're still not they're not at they're not going to win more seats than the Conservatives? We'll go, Aaron, and we'll go through everybody else. Well, I mean, but before I even you know give my individual analysis, I think that if this model is correct, it's almost kind of similar to Canadian politics in that the Liberal Party at some points in the general was polling a lot below the conservatives, but yet they were still ahead in uh, ridings. But I think that I do, I have said this for a while, but I think that, you know, Labour aren't going to do it as well in the North as the models are currently predicting, because there's, you know, in every seat, really in RT, there's a context and certain MPs won't be punished in the, for the decisions of the government in the same way that they were in 2019 for Labour. Uh, when, when the, you know, people in Don, like the MP for Don Valley, whose name's gone out of my head, lost her seat despite the fact she'd been, you know, fighting for the deal and been quite against the Labour leadership. But what 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 we're really seeing here is we're seeing what the the, the consequences of when you have a large uh, vote share gap, but not as much seat wise. Because what what happened in the last election is we had 
a, I think it was an 11% gap between the Labour and the Conservatives. And, you know, the Conservatives only had, you know, I think it was what, 40 seats over the uh, 326, which, you know, if, if you were to look in a traditional model in the history, so for Labour to be that low, the Conservatives would be, you know, near 400 seats. So I think that really this is kind of why we're seeing a very much difference between. Um, but more than that, I think that another key indicator, which I don't think any model is really going to look at, but is voter motivation. I can imagine there's going to be quite a few seats with low turnouts because no one as of yet is currently enthusiastic about either of the main parties. And I think that's a really important uh, element because you know we, we saw we, we've seen in 2001 there was a low motivation when nothing much changed even though at certain points the polls were looking closer and I, I think that if turnout gets hit again which is already what we've seen in by-elections of old Bexley and Sithcup then I think that uh, the model could be 100% well not 100% but very close to accurate. Uh, we'll go to, to to Johnny next, but one point I do want to make, though, and, and you made a really good point about that, is that um, in the past, you'd expect the Conservatives to have been of well over 400 based on that popular vote, but a lot of these seats are now becoming entrenched, and even if you go back to the 90s, Scotland is really a big piece of this, too, because Labour won dozens of seats in Scotland in back in the 90s in, in the Tony Blair era, 90s and early 2000s, but now... That's SNP, right? We got the SNP on 52 seats, and that's only a gain of three, four. Again, SNP collapses near elections. They, they can never finish them off. But even then, okay, so they're still at 45, 40 some odd, high 40s, right? Those are seats that are just off the board, right? Labor can't win those seats anymore, right? Labor can't win them. Lib Dems can't win them. The Tories can't win them. Those are just seats that are off the board. And it, like, when you have a Tory blow like you've had in. 19 and to us like obviously 17 was a Tory win when you have stuff like that it makes it a lot more difficult like when those seats are just off the board unwinnable for any of the other parties it makes it a lot difficult to a stat to win a majority outright right um Johnny what do you think about this um what in terms of the whole prediction the north south divide yeah like do you do you do you foresee it uh, like and again we talked about this uh, Aaron made the, the point about Canada I also make the same point about the US right Joe Biden won the popular vote by five points would have lost the electoral college if you flip like I, I can't remember the exact number but it's something like a hundred thousand votes in in five states in like three states like it's not a lot there right very possible he could have lost that right the, we know about the the popular vote gap in in the US we know about it in Canada my model suggests that it exists in the UK. Do you agree or do you think that it's going to follow a lot more? Um, Labour gets more votes, Labour gets more seats. Um, no, I, I agree with you. I think you probably will find a situation where, um, you know, Labour can probably win the popular vote, but um, you'll still find in a situation, or actually, sorry, I mean, the Conservatives win the popular vote, but you can still probably find that Labour um, Labour wins the most seats because you'll find that there are so many uh, seats which have happened really since 20, uh, 2010 when the Conservatives started taking seats off Labour in that sort of Midlands sort of region area where it's just every election has just become more and more Conservative where I think even... If Labour was to have a good election, you'd still find that there are quite a few seats. I'm going to get you. Hi, you highlight Nuneaton. Let's Nuneaton is one example of this, where the Conservatives took it off Labour, and in in 2015, it was that seat Labour needed to take if they were going to have a good election. But it was it was a really bad result for Labour in 2015, and since then, it's just become more of a concern. It's not even close anymore. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure your viewers will go on Wikipedia and find the actual results speak for themselves. But you can, you'll probably seats like Nanita are the reason why. Um, as as much as La Labour will win, possibly the um, popular vote, the Conservatives will. Sorry, the Conservatives win the popular vote, but Labour still win the most seats. It's ugly seats like the Neaton. But the reason why Labour will probably win the most seats is because they they 
edge out a few gains in those crucial seats that they need to take in the South, win it by fairly small margins, probably 1,000, 2,000, and create that sort of system that you were talking about, Robert. Yeah. Um, all right, I'll go I'll go to you, Zoe. Um, now, again, we, we've talked about that. I think we, we've talked enough about kind of popular vote inefficiencies. What do you foresee happening, right? So let's say, let's say, I don't know. Let's say we go to the end of this, and it's, I think that the next fixed election date theoretically would be like the May something of 2024. Let's say we wake up, or well, I'd be awake anyways because it's this happening. This is happening at like midnight my time is when you guys wake up at 5 a.m. But basically, whatever. Let's say you guys wake up in, in on May 5th in 2024, and we see you see. Conservative's largest party, 295, Labour at 250, S&P. Let's say you see this result. What do you think happens? What, what What's the next thing that happens in, in, in UK politics? Uh, if Tories are on 295 and Labour on 250, every leader wants to put their head in a washing machine and just put it on and die because that would be like, an unparalleled, like a lot of stress. But I don't know what coalitions would be made there because you'd have the Tories needing... 295 they'd need 31 seats the Lib Dems won't do it because they have and look how well that went for them the DUP won't do it for exactly the same reason but then if Labour tried to do it firstly you can only imagine the second place doesn't mean winning the leaflets would be flying through doors from the day after and then surely like if the Lib Dems the Greens the SNP if Keir Starmer's you know lacking a spine all the kind of left-leaning parties did, it wouldn't last very long because, you know, it's often said if Labour spent more time, all the time arguing with the Tories, it spends arguing with itself, they'd be in government by now. But, you know, it, yeah, you can't really, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, that result wouldn't last very long because it'd have to be another general election inside two years because you could just be, vote no confidence in it so quickly and it just pass in general election. Can I come on that, if that's okay? Um, because it's a very interesting situation is you could get another 1974. Yeah, I was just thinking Labour, that, yeah. Yeah, whereby Labour didn't get enough and they called another general election, they got enough. And I think that if that happens, that would be the most interesting thing because we can see these models at the moment. But if no party has legitimacy to govern, you know, in that instance, Labour bounced up and just got above the required amount. You know, could the Conservatives do that? I don't know. Could Labour just do that? Could people just give up? You know, could we see, you know, a, 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 people usually call a never ending for referendums, but a never general election because it will never end until someone gets a majority? Because the reality is, is that Labour aren't going to go with the SNP because if they go in the SNP, everyone in England will turn against them. They, the Lib Dems aren't big enough. They'd have to get around 310, I reckon. If, to be to go with the Lib Dems, and they may even argue at that point to just go alone as a minority and have a confidence and supply, much like the Conservatives did with Theresa May. And the Conservatives have just completely destroyed any relationship with any other party. So they actually need a majority, or they cannot govern. Yeah, Kyle, what do you what what do you think would happen if we see a result like this? Like, do you see? Are we, are we just going to keep getting elections? Are we just going to become? Are this, is the UK just going to become Italy? Or, um, like, wh- what's the what's the political solution here? Also, I was a question. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, Kyle, who would even call that election? Let, let's say it's. Is, I would assume it's what Boris would be still prime minister. So he'd just basically be like, yeah, yeah no, no, go- no government can form. No government has. Thing, the, yeah. yeah, no government has confidence. So I think the Queen's just like, all right, let's do it again. Right back. What do you think, yeah. Kyle? I mean, ironically, this situation, Italy would have a, a more stable government than the UK. Um, because at least Italy's governments, government parties can sort of form up together without, you know, everybody being branded as a traitor um, below a certain borderline in the north. Um, I mean, it's the same thing as Aaron and Zoe have said. There's no way to govern out of that. Um, Labour being too low, they can't work with the SNP without, you know, essentially ruining and tarnishing themselves. Um, and Lib Dems are just too low um and they can't even really help the conservatives in that case um like it would just it's essentially nothing it's uh the same situation that you know uh 
parties in Sweden keep finding themselves in, where you know it's either the social democrats or the moderates, uh, and then they have the the sort of far right Swedish Democrats, and nobody wants to govern with them, but they keep taking up too many seats in the goddamn parliament, so they have to try to figure out a way around it. Um, that's why you had that prime minister for seven hours before she had to resign because they didn't know what the hell to do. Um, so it, it's just it's too tough, and labor has got a especially with this modeling and um not the the swing modeling we see from others but if you know and i trust this model um more than most but if this was the result it's impossible like labor has no hope of doing anything um all they can make the case for is that leave uh they'll lend uh some sort of you know supply to the conservatives but they have to have a proper you know give and take with them but that i mean that's not going to happen that'll never happen so Looks like Robert, elections for years. Oh. Yeah, go ahead, Johnny. Uh, sorry to disturb you, Carl. Um, I think a result like this would be very akin to, to put it into modern times. The when the when the government struggled to get its Brexit legislation through Parliament a couple of years ago, there was a That's genuine a deadlock in Parliament where, yes, there were also Remain Conservative rebels, but. The government was operating on a majority of minus 42 at the point because there were conservatives who obviously defected and conservatives having their whips withdrawn. We could, on a result like that, we would be heading towards a parliamentary paralysis, uh, paralysis like that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting example, and it is it's probably the most recent example we've had of it. The thing, though, is that while it would actually, um, while it would basically be similar to that, it would be now that for everything, right? So, for example, if the government was trying to pass Brexit legislation, yeah, there's a problem, but, hey, the government's trying to pass a budget? Yeah, okay, cool, we're good, we're good, right? We'll vote for that budget, that's fine. But then on Brexit legislation, it's like, no, 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 we're going to vote with the opposition, right? But now it's just like, cool, now everything is Brexit now. <laughs> and and that's, the, that's the kind of problem, right? So that would really kind of mess up all this stuff, right? So, all right. Let's... There, could be an, there could be an instance where a party gets into power on the promise that they hold a general election within a certain period of time. Because that, that's happened before. Yeah. In 1974. And I genuinely think that that could be the likely outcome, whereby uh, the Lib Dems and certain Labour MPs would make a deal with Boris Johnson that he has, he, in a binding deal, has to hold a general election within the year or within a year. And then we'd have another instance of two general elections. That would be my best guess because I can't see any party working together at this point. Yeah, it's it's a really in, that would be a really interesting thing. And again, to be fair, there's a couple of things here. Again, we're we're, we're pretending that the model result or something similar to the model result again, this odd seat here and odd seat there is very similar to what we're going to get on election night in the UK, right? A couple of things wrong with that is that one. Um, obviously the model can, can be wrong, right? It's not a guarantee if there was some sort of special, like this model is not the greatest for strategic voting. There could definitely be some strategic voting it's missing. So Lib Gems could pick up enough seats in the South off the Tories that right now we have, we have a lot of split competition between Labour and Lib Dems in some seats in the South. If there is a higher degree of strategic voting, Lib Dems could pick those seats off, and then that could give them enough to, to make a coalition government with Labour and maybe the SNP. Again, not the most stable government. That's still a little bit shaky, but that is a potential option. Labour could make more gains in the Northern Leave seats. I don't think they will, but it's definitely a possibility. So, I mean, we're going to we're gonna have to see a lot more can happen. And again, also at the same time, Conservatives are really being beat up by this, um, by this Boris Johnson scandal. If he's gone in three months, four months, whatever, I and again, this is going to segue into our next, to next topic. If he's gone in a couple of months, there's a new conservative leader. They rebound in the polls. Like this could potentially be the low point of the conservative support. If the if the absolute trough of conservative support is losing to Labour by six points, you're in a pretty good position, conservatives. You take take a bow there. That's like you've you've punt you functionally locked in um, forever, being very close to winning every election. If the, if the lowest point you can get to is thirty two percent in like a five party system. Um, now this kind of segues into the next thing because we're gonna talk about kind of the state of the parties and what's gonna happen in the UK. Now obviously. You've got the Omicron variant, which again, 
um, sweeping not just the UK, obviously the UK is massively affected, but us and Canada too. You got you three are from the UK. Kyle and I were in we're in Canada, specifically Ontario, um, specifically the GTA. Again, COVID cases just out of control here in, in Canada as well. Just across the globe, this is rapidly accelerating. And to be fair, we're going to speculate a bit here on here, but we don't actually don't know um, what the outcomes of this are going to be in the next uh, little bit. Um, it could improve. It could get worse. We could be looking at a much more prolonged. Now, again, preliminary evidence, some evidence we're seeing to, as of today is saying that Omicron variant could be a little bit mild, more transmissible, but more mild, which again could potentially augur the, the complete end of this pandemic once enough people have been immunized from Omicron. Um, at the same time, again, this is science, things can be wrong. Um, but let's say, for example, what do we think is most likely to happen? Let's talk about the UK specifically. Canada, I think, is going to follow a very similar tact. Um, Canada today, of course, Trudeau announcing more um, lockdown benefits for workers affected by a lockdown, which again, there's currently no lockdown. So that's kind of implying something that doesn't exist yet, as we know, right? So again, everybody's kind of staring down the barrel of a lockdown here. If there is another lockdown, let's go to Aaron on this first. If there is another lockdown, do you, do you think Boris Johnson is going to bring in a lockdown? Will it hurt them? And then what happens after that? Does the conservative government kind of show them the door after we get through this crisis and they find a new leader who's not tarnished by all the Christmas parties? Uh, what, what do you think is going to happen here, Aaron? Okay, so I'll answer both. Qu I feel like there's two different questions there. So I'm going to answer what I think is going to happen. Uh, here's, here's the interesting thing. It's because if you do look on social media, you see an abundance of anti-lockdownism from all sides of the political spectrum where everyone is sick of lockdown. But if you do look at pollsters, they don't indicate that lockdown is actually the popular choice. So I think, so it's kind of hard to gauge of what I'm seeing versus what you know the pollsters are telling me. But I think I can't, I don't really think that they're going to have a lockdown. I think that it's I mean it's extremely unpopular within the backbench of the Conservatives, which I think may play into it in terms of leadership and 1922 letters. But I think more than that, I think that they're, they're too economically driven to want another lockdown. So they would try to do everything they can possibly do to ensure that lockdown doesn't happen, which is why we're seeing this massive rush for boosters, which is seemingly somewhat successful with boosters being driven extensively. But more than that, from the data I've seen, we've seen very few hospitalizations, we've seen very few deaths, we've, but we've seen a drastic cause of cases. Now, the question is, is what do we want to do for the future? Do we want to be a nation that locks down at every COVID scare, which is likely going to happen because it's a virus and viruses very rarely disappear, especially like this, we've had flu for how many years? Or are we going to be a nation that locks down at every single scare? And I think that the government, being in their uh, the ideological nature, are more inclined possibly to go with the former. They're having a lot of pressure with people, you know, I mean, former Prime Minister Theresa May has indicated that she's, you know, kind of getting sick of all this. And I think that, that there are enough influence on the right of the party and, and on the libertarian side of the party to not have this any restrictions. I mean, the, from all accounts, the cabinet is completely split on it. But I think that it, there's enough influential members to not have enough another lockdown specifically i think more restrictions are, are possible i don't think we'll go for lockdown okay and then uh, i'll actually say then, one more thing to yeah i'll say one more thing to aaron and then i'll get everybody else in on the same thing so then at that point then let's say there's no lockdown and then does does boris just keep plotting on and then to the next election or do, do you think that once this is this scare is kind of over that then they just immediately we get a bunch of letters 1922 committee and then we we get a new leader what do you think well, I think that they should do. Uh, I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll structure my argument in two points. Is that really that's if the Conservative Party want to get stay in power and have a majority government, what they need to do is have fresh blood. What you have is if you have a bunch of scares within government of people who have broken lockdown, and it's not just government. You've seen the former uh, mayor of London candidate Sean Bailey have these types of things. You know, I think that there's no, there, there is no uh, individual that's going to be safe. You know, we've had the cabinet secretary i think it was who who had issues rishi stunak's office has had you know stuff about it which maybe is why he's kept quiet in recent uh weeks but you know what you should be looking at is, is i think that you should be looking at a 
someone who's on the back bench, who's, who's no longer tarnished, bring through a bunch of, what, you, what you've had in the last 10 years is a bunch of new, fresh blood come in from the 2010 intake, you know, the much smaller 2015 intake and the much drastically larger 2019 intake. And there are people there who have their own cult followings. And some of them, yes, who are a lot less well known, but people who have turned marginal seats into, well, not safe seats, but, you know, uh, quite comfortable seats, I think I'll go with. And I think that those are people who potentially you, you could use to be the new face of the party because that's what Boris did amazingly and all credit to him he came in to, he said this is a new conservative government he brought he, he even though there's a lot of similar faces it felt fresh and new which is what people look to and I think if a new leader with a new face and new support system um you know in, in the cabinet is in there I think that you could see a massive bounce because let's not forget this isn't a pro-Labour change in the polls, it's an anti-Conservative. And if that government's gone and a new face who don't have this mountain of scandals behind them come in, then you're seeing, I th you'll see a massive bounce and I think they'll get over 40% again. Now, does, do I think that will happen? I have no idea. I think that if it doesn't happen in January, I can't see it happening because this is at the fresh moment after North Shropshire, after all the scandals, after what was described as the drip drop of new scandals going on, I can genuinely, I, I genuinely think that if they're going to have any action, it has to be now. Okay, let's let's change up the order. Instead of Johnny, let's go, let's go Zoe here. What are your thoughts on this? Do you think the UK is heading to a lockdown? And then, and then what does that mean for Boris Johnson's leadership, depending on his decision on that? What do you think? Uh, I... I'm not going to act like I know what's coming. I I don't know if there's a lot on coming. I know he wouldn't dare do it over Christmas. And I know he isn't because he can't. He also promised his backbenchers. Now, I'm aware Boris perhaps isn't the best one for keeping promises, but he promised his backbenchers that he would uh, recall Parliament if he wanted to bring in a lockdown. And he hasn't yet. And you have to give five hours notice. So he might. I'm not sure he will because it'll cost money and... It's unpopular, and I'm not sure how people would follow it because he didn't. And also, as we're recording this, Dominic Cummings has said, as we're recording it today, that he's going to release pictures of parties tomorrow, so they'll be oh, out no. there. Oh, uh, no. in indeed, indeed. So we've all got that to look forward to. Uh, Dominic Cummings is going to release pictures, so that will probably incriminate a number of people. So I don't know. I think this story has more to go, but with. It, will there be a lockdown? I don't think it'll be formal, non-essential shop shut in. I don't think it'll be like lockdown one we had, but I think restrictions of some kind are coming. I think the rule of six has been introduced in Wales. I think we might see something similar here. How do I think that'll impact Boris? Primarily in his own party, because people in the pub will do what they want, but people in his own party, you saw how people reacted when he introduced plan B. And there was a massive rebellion and he only got it through because of Labour votes. But like if he does it, more letters will be going in because it'll just make people it'll, it'll probably make him unpopular because in line with the drip drip of more stories, Dominic Cummins of parties, it's just hypocritical. How can you say like it won't come across well, so it'll hit him in the polls? Yeah. I Oh, you, you're talking about Dominic Cummings there. That's hilarious. Just imagine Dominic Cummings sitting in in the corner there in some parties, just taking pictures of of who's there, and it's just it's he hilarious. Was that one? Have you seen that picture? No, I don't think I've seen that picture. No, that's just hilarious. Oh, no, one, of course he'd be. No, of course he would be. Yeah, that's that's hilarious. Him just taking pictures, being like, "I'm going to use this one day to to take out Boris Johnson." That's that's just great. Um, like whenever you see these pictures of these like parties and stuff, it's just hilarious because it's like. Who took this and why? Like you were at this party, you were like, "Yes, this is great. I can use this against uh, against Boris Johnson in the future." That's uh, that great way to think about that. He, he, as if he knew, but he obviously knew. But, anyways, uh, Johnny, I'll come to you now. Um, again, kind of the same t same thing. UK, are you heading to lockdown or not? And then what happens to Boris after after that decision is made and, and going forward? What do you think? I wouldn't say we're heading into lockdown necessarily. Um... I'd probably say we'd be heading towards rule of six sort of rules. Can't see us going into lockdown, though. It's too drastic. I don't think the public would support it, given the hardship that they've had to go through these past 
nearly two years. Uh, whether the, the, the people who'd be most angry about if we were to go into lockdown or if any drastic measures would be introduced would be uh, the backbenchers within the Conservative Party. They'd be the ones who'd be really going after Boris and saying, look, enough's enough. This is completely unconservative. And I think that would be the trigger for so many backbenchers to send in letters to the, uh, the 1922 committee. Did you ask me about whether, um, whether I'd think Boris would last or not long, did you say? Yeah, do you so so let's let's follow your path forward, right? So you say there's no lockdown then basically once this scare is over because again, we've even seen some data from South Africa that suggests that this case just rapidly spikes and then it comes down. Now again, we're in that rapidly uptick of it and again, there's different factors of that. Again, obviously South Africa probably not the greatest testing capacity for COVID as well. Again, when you're looking like, and even we're going to start his, hitting, like we're probably going to see a peak of, of tests of, of like positive test results, not just because of, because the cases are, are peaking, but because literally people are just like, we can only test so many people a day. And if so many people are positive and you're getting these rapid tests, what's the point in going to a clinic and getting tested yourself? If you already know you're positive, right? You're just going to stay at home and isolate. So we're, we're not even going to catch all the cases and we're just going to hit a point where we're just going to, we're going to be peeking out at that. What happens after we get through this, right? So let's assume no lockdown. You basically let Omicron run, run wild through the entire country. Let's say. Yeah. Eventually cases peak. They come back down a couple months later, probably February or so probably before the local elections. So like, what does, does, do they try to take up Boris before the local elections? Wait, if it's a bad showing at the local elections, like, what do you think? It depends whether the backbenchers can mobilize or not, whether they'll be able to mobilize before the local elections or not. I doubt it. I think if the conservatives have a poor set of local elections next year, then I think that would mobilize a lot more backbenchers. But for now, I think Boris is, I think Boris is safe. I, I say this reluctantly, but I think Boris is safe until at least after the local elections. That's that's a f that's pretty fair, I think. I think the question does become though if they're the portal numbers start really cratering and then stuff becomes at risk. Not a ton of mayoral stuff is up yet. A lot of London boroughs though, and those could get really bloody if there's a lot of legacy kind of conservative seats in and around London in in for wards and. If and those are definitely at risk from labor. If you start seeing a massive swing against Boris in, in remain areas, if conservatives get shredded in those seats, that's gonna people are gonna notice, and people will then immediately start turning on on Boris, right? So, yeah, it's um, it it could be very interesting to see. I I, I tend to agree. I mean, this is this, this is hilarious. We could be if if it's a bad set for Boris, Boris could be gone. That being said, if they recover and it's a bad set for labor, I could definitely see them making a move on Starmer too. So, um. That really could go. No, you don't see that, Johnny. I don't see it because they just be they. Labour have come. I mean, by the time we get to the local elections, it'll be two years since Starmer became leader. The problem is, is whether the left would be able to mobilise its support, and also who who would be the sort of continuity Starmer candidate. I know Starmer hasn't. There's no sort of Starmerite policies within Labour. It's basically sort of. That, and and this is the problem. You don't know what Starmer stands for. So who would be able to be a successful successor to Keir Starmer remains to be seen. And that's the problem. And you could say the same for Boris. Who on earth would be able to replace Boris? And that's probably why the backbenchers haven't mobilised yet, because there's no, they're not rallying around one person who they trust among, amongst their backbench circles to take over from Boris, who's not seen to be part of the cabal of the cabinet, which has been plagued with these sort of scandals. And that's the same with Labour, to be honest. Although they've not been mired in government scandals, for example, they've just been mired in poor leadership. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's fair. Um, I don't know. I, to be honest, the Conservative Party leadership race is one that I have zero read on. I don't like. I, there's a lot of candidates. I actually have no idea who would win. I, it you can make cases for a lot of actual people. I tend to think it's a lot smaller, but it's 
it, it that can be a very interesting an interesting race as well for labor i think there are people who would create a different tact from from starmer i think that's kind of what labor needs um the thing of it is, and I'll just say this: this isn't this isn't the NFL. This is this is the English Premier League. Sucking doesn't uh, get you a better draft pick. It, it gets you regulated, right? Like, um, so like you you want you have to do good, right? If you don't do good, then there's no you don't get bonuses for doing good. You get you get relegated down to the championship. Um, Kyle, let's get you in on here. What do you think? Do you think the UK is heading to a lockdown? Do you think that Boris is toast? Is it going to rely on locals? What do you think? Uh no, I don't think I can do a lockdown, uh, mostly for the reasons that have been already articulated. There might be a similar situation to like how we're facing Ontario, where we have restrictions on, uh, you know, oh, you can only have 10 people at your restaurant and 25 people outdoors, things like that, but not a full lockdown. Kyle, those aren't uh, working here. They're not. I don't know what news you're I know they're not working. I know they're not working. I'm just saying this is what the government's putting in, right? Like, yeah. the government wants to put in restrictions over Christmas holidays, especially one that's going to be facing. Uh, elections anytime soon um so i don't think there'll be a lockdown unless it gets really severe and omicron you know it's still lethal but it's by all of it by a lot of evidence so far particularly among the vaccinated it's not as bad as people are going to be the argument's going to be let's just get on with our lives whatever you think of that um i don't think boris is in any danger of losing his leadership unless the locals are really bad for him um I was having a conversation with my Welsh friend and uh, we're basically talking about, you know, the sort of sentiment among the, the common folk. Um, and, you know, nobody's pleased with Boris, but the, there's no figure, particularly in like the conservative benches. There's no Michael Heseltine, you know, there's no, like, there's nobody that's going to be organizing the back benches against them. Um, if he did go to a lockdown, maybe Michael Gov could be that. I don't know. Um, I know Truss and, and Sunak are uh, trying to organize something in the background, but there's no there's no uh, center of gravity opposing Boris at this point. So who would take him out? It would have to be a massive fumble in local elections in order to actually uh, doom him. Um, and I just don't see that happening for again all the reasons that have been articulated here. Um, I, mean, I mean, if I, if I'm gonna I'm gonna come on this yeah go ahead on this if that's okay. Because us, it's you know it's a very interesting thing that we talk about. Both there's no natural Starmer uh, replacement or oh, figure, and there's no natural uh, Boris figure. And I think that f- for me, I think that that's two really bad ways to think about this. Because I think that both parties need someone different, and that's that's the important thing. Um, I think that there is certainly leaders on the conservative side that are coming out i guess you could you could you could quantify it as alternatives steve baker is one that's trying to establish himself uh maybe not potentially for leadership as an alternative but i think that there are a lot of other figures outside of the um the the traditional party i guess you know everyone always looks at the cabinet but i think that the cabinet is probably the worst people to look at right now I think yeah, but but the, the problem but is like you know there, there might... are backbenchers. There are back. I I would say that there's a few backbenchers who control, but certainly be people who I think could be credible alternatives. You know, I I don't think we. You know, yes, there's not a hassle time, but I think that really you you don't really should be looking for uh, someone like hassle time. Um, there's there's more important figures and types of politicians that you need. Yeah, but um, are any of them like, like ideally, need? Bojo, like Boris himself was that versus uh, May. I mean, May kind of fell over on a cord in a sense. Well, but you know, like, but Boris was the the other the opposing center of gravity in that case. Like some backbencher that I don't even know what constituency is from. Uh, whoever you mentioned, you know, like they're not going to do it. You know, you need somebody to rally around. You can't just have a mass and then everybody says, what do we do now? You know, I think you under I think you underestimate the power of backbenchers in the Conservative Party. I think that there are a lot of figures. I'm going to you know that there's a few I could probably name um, who you may not be aware of. But, you know, there are lots of people. 
there have been lots of leaders that no one, the public didn't really know before they became leader. And I think that more importantly, there's a lot of figures that people uh, that that should come to the forefront. There are lots of people who I think that could take the Conservative Party in a completely different direction, which currently, if what we're looking at at the moment, is certainly needed. Okay. Yeah, I think that's I think that's pretty fair. So I think overall, I think we could summarize the last kind of section you were talking about is no one thinks the UK is heading to a lockdown. Um, I'm going to I'm going to take I'm going to take the the uh, I'm going to take the counter to that. I'm actually going to take the, the opposite way. I think there will be a lockdown. It will not be as like severe. <laughs> I, I could see school closures and stuff like that. I think there will also be one in Ontario, too. I'm, gonna, I'm calling Doug Ford's bluff. There's no way he's going to follow through with that. Um, again, that's, we're talking about the UK here, but that's fine. But no, the thing is, when you're looking at hospital capacity, even if, even though Omicron is less deadly, I mean, here's the thing. At this point, it is impossible to stop the spread of this, right? It's, it's, it's going to spread basically through everybody. This is way more infectious. At this point, even having a lockdown, it's just to slow it down. It's not to stop the spread completely. We, Omicron's going to rip through the population anyways. If you go to a lockdown, you'll be able to save hospital capacity a little bit better. I think they're going to have to go to there. I don't, I don't think it's going to be a particularly long lockdown. I see it for about a month or two, and then we're out, and especially through to give people a chance to boost. But I, I see there being a lockdown in, in both areas. And I think Boris then goes to the locals. Maybe he gets killed or not. I don't know. But there, I, I suspect he... We'll go through last question here for everybody here, basically. Does Boris lead the party in the next general election? We'll go through everybody and we'll ask that question. Aaron, does does Boris lead the, lead the party in the next general election? He shouldn't. But does he, I though? But that, does he? I think there's a 55% chance he does, 45% chance he doesn't. Ooh, that's interesting. That, that's an interesting take. It's going to really depend on his poll numbers, whether or not they recover or not. Johnny, what do you think? I think he will, very reluctantly, but I think he knows his position amongst the backbenchers will be... So There'll be quite a negative reaction to the... Um, especially with those Northern MPs if Boris leads the party into the next election because we know the Northern MPs are quite rebellious. They'll speak their mind when they need to. And they're more than happily will criticise Boris. I don't want him to lead the party into the next election. I see him as a one-trick pony, especially when it came to Brexit. But sadly, my gut thinks he will, and with bad consequences, unless some unless something happens within Labour or government support manages to go up again. <sighs> I reluctantly see him leading the party into the next election. Zoe, what do you what do you got here? Uh, I don't know. I'll hesitantly say no, because the backbench Ooh. of the Conservative Party. I know why not. Why not? Just mix it up a bit. Uh, the backbench of the Conservative Party is always rebellious, and there is never any lack of ambition in the Tory Party. So. If Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak wanted to oust him now, they probably could. They could just say to all their supporters, write letters, and they'd, you know, get the contest they want. But I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. But I'm for, I'm realizing it's a podcast. I'm shrugging my shoulders. I'm, you know, I don't know. But I there, don't think so. There, I think there is no video here, so you're you're shrugging the shoulders, not being conveyed to the audience here. But yeah, it's yeah. good. It, yeah, it, there is uncertainty on this. It, it's definitely not a given either way. Kyle, what do you think? I think he leads uh, again, barring a horrible, very bad, no good local elections uh, next year. Um, I think he'll lead into the next election easily. Um, I just I don't think the backbench is going to organize itself enough. Um, I think too many of them also know their their jobs rely, especially in those northern seats, rely on Boris being the face of the party because those northerners love them some Boris, you know. So I think he'll be there for a while. Um, unfortunate as it may be wow okay so I, i'm gonna i'm gonna agree with zoe here i think wow, you guys, really okay i think you guys are really underpriced like yes there's this scandal but i think you guys are really underpricing the ability that the chances that there could be another scandal somewhere again not tied to 
Christmas parties during lockdowns. If there's another scandal somewhere, how do they survive that? I don't think they do. And I think that's a really big problem for them. Um, like right now, like you, you, you hear some of these voters. I, I, I watch like video segments on a couple of these voters. They're like, oh, we thought Boris was something he's not. That is not the kind of thing you recover from, especially like, again, maybe you can recover from the, the Christmas parties and, and breaking the rules. That's fine. Maybe you can recover from that over a couple of months, especially if COVID goes to the back of people's minds and, and, and we don't care about the pandemic anymore. But like what happens to the next scandal and the next one and the next one? There's a big, much bigger chance of there being more scandals after this one. Again, Boris has not been immune to scandal. This is this is not his first one. There's been a long line of scandals here, except this one is kind of really punching through. If we've gotten to the point where people are fed up and tired of conservative scandals, then those point numbers are only going to get worse and worse. And as, as kind of Zoe was saying... These conservative backbenchers, they have knives in their pockets all the time. Like they are not afraid. They are not. They are not afraid to knife uh, a, a leader if they if they fall even a little bit in the polls. They know exactly what they're doing. They they're making sure they're going to save their jobs, and I I expect them to pull the plug. Like generally, the if you go back dozens of years, basically, once the conservative party starts changing new leaders in and out rapidly, that's when they start running. It. That's when they're starting to generally do worse and that's eventually when the next labor party comes up so like when you look at it whenever they start changing leaders it's not like they change a bunch of leaders rapidly and then one guy stays for a long time it's generally like they keep changing leaders and then eventually they lose badly in the next general election um anybody else want to say anything to that or i mean i think that this really is is very similar to the 1950s in terms of the conservative party and obviously howard mcmillan was gone why Boris? That's why I put it to fifty-five percent. Yes, simply because um, I just don't know if there's enough backbone. Yeah, yeah. that's a very floppy. Group. It's a very I floppy think, group. This conservative caucus. I apparently. think that that one hundred percent should be just an electoral thing. I one hundred percent think there's the people to do it in terms of. Venture specifically, I don't think that a Rishi Sunak or Liz Truss would be the best crop, but I think that it's highly possible that they won't because they are too. Yeah, they don't have any backbone, and that's 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 the sad part. I think. But yeah, that... it's it's some interesting, some very interesting things could happen. We could be looking at. Again, the local elections, and again, we will be covering the local elections. We modeled them last year. Hopefully, we'll be modeling them again. Maybe down to the seat level. Depends how much time I have between now and May. We'll see. Um, but Don't yeah. do the seat level, I swear to God. Don't do the Can I just come in quickly, Robert? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Johnny. I think if there was a genuine alternative to Boris, I think he would have been out by now. Because That's fair. If, I'm exactly. going to compare one result. Um, there was a by-election about 30 or so years ago in Eastbourne, in which the... Con- uh, the previous MP was murdered by the IRA, and the Liberal Democrats won the ensuing by-election. The uh, sorry, the ensuing by-election. That was the end of Thatcher. There was credible candidates in her place to ensure her removal and proceed with a leadership contest. If there was someone, even from the maybe not from the cabinet, but any any old backbencher who was had some support amongst the Conservative caucus, he would have been out by now. But there's, I mean, the specific context around the Thatcher's going is you have people like Sir Geoffrey Hurst resigning and giving one of the most damning speeches in parliamentary history. But more than that, the, 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 the by-election in North Shropshire happened at the most perfect time for Boris Johnson because now, now, they're in re- now you're in recess, you can't you know, this isn't this isn't going to be the moment that anyone sends letters because the parliament's in recess. That that's the reality. The only one that's been sent, I think, was actually before the by election of uh, the MP for North Bennett. And you're not, I don't, so I don't think you're actually allowed to send letters whilst parliament's in recess. So we, we're not going to know. Well, the rules happen. were changed. It was, I think, Graham Brady, the chairman of the 1922 committee, announced that um, in light of what was going on that letters could be sent over the Christmas period. So there was a rule change in that. I think Roger Gale, the MP for North Bannett, did send a letter when 
the result of the by-election became known? I, I can I definitely think that there will be action. I mean, we saw we saw with the WhatsApp group chat that there's so much anti-Boris testament. The the issue is 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 the Theresa May issue where you've got a lot of people not supporting, but do you have fifty percent? And that that's really the question, which is why I don't think there's I think there's credible alternatives. But again, as I said, with Thatcher, there's very different context. Yeah, I think I think that is kind of the interesting thing too. Is one of the reasons why it is Boris is because other candidates are so not amazing. Like no one's pounding the table for Michael Gove or Jeremy Hunt, Prime Minister. Like no one's like, yes, those people should be. Like there's not a lot of there's not a lot of people who you you look at them in in the Tory party and you're like, yes, this is exactly like there there are certain elements of it like leadership and ambition and 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 a and a vision and i don't really see a ton of people having that specifically johnson when you look at it from that perspective boris johnson was kind of the one who had the most vision he had i mean it was a it was not really particularly strong vision but he had a vision of a kind of of a brexit going a certain way and people bought into that vision and i like i don't associate a particularly bold vision with michael gove or, or jeremy hunt or anybody particularly outside of that so it's it's a very interesting thing, and, and we're going to have to see how this happens down the stretch. And again, we're going to be following this, and maybe there's maybe there's a maybe there's another scandal. Maybe these pictures from Dominic Cummings are really bad. I don't know how bad they could possibly be, but maybe they are. Who knows? But anyways, I think that's more than enough time for for today. Um, because again, it is late now in, in the UK for you guys. So well, thank you everybody for coming on. Um, I'll let you guys uh, give yourselves a plug here quickly. You can plug your Twitter accounts and we can get you guys some followers from that. Um, but yeah, thank you everybody for coming on. Um, Aaron, go ahead for you first. Uh, uh, Aaron underscore G Smith is my Twitter. I tweet very bad takes that you can enjoy. Yep. Uh, Johnny, if you want to give yourself a plug. Uh, yes, at Johnny, J-O-N-N-Y, Ross, R-O-S-S, zero five. And you'll see some really bad political takes. Zoe? Uh, at Zoe Walsh, underscore, underscore. And I mostly tweet at Aaron, underscore, G Smith, with various memes. So follow me if you want to see the memes I send Aaron. Of course, you can follow. Uh, I'll give let Kyle make his own plug here. Go ahead, Kyle. Oh, uh, at Kyle J. Hutton. Um... I mostly just complain about things. He does, yes, but he he also tweets maps sometimes, and it's in, in good analysis. So so definitely follow him, and and yeah. So thank you guys for coming um coming onto the podcast. It, it's been a blast. We'll definitely have you guys on to talk about the UK again in the future, and maybe we'll talk about the locals and and in a couple months and, and see where they're going from there. Uh, a lot can happen, and and I don't know where it's going, and I don't think anybody else particularly knows where it's going. A lot can change in the next couple of months, not just in the UK, but in pretty much every other country, except the US, I think is kind of locked in a certain way, but pretty much every, a lot can change in pretty much every other country in just a couple of weeks, um, based on how Omicron goes. So thank you. Thank you for everybody. Uh, thank you for coming on and, and your analysis. And yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you. And we'll, we'll talk to you later. All right. Thank Bye-bye. you. everybody. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you. you. Doodles.